A very common question people ask about Final Fantasy is, which game should I play first? There's so many Final Fantasy games out there, and so many ports and remasters and re-releases of them, that it can be overwhelming. The short answer for my recommendations to a newcomer are 4, 6, 7, 9, or 10. Each is a very good game that is enjoyable and approachable for someone unfamiliar with the series. As for how to play them, the first six games are most readily accessible through their Pixel Remaster ports for Steam and Mobile, while most of the later games have remasters available on the PS4, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and Steam. The exception is 13, which is on the PS3, Xbox 360, and Steam. But the truth is, which Final Fantasy should I play first doesn't have a simple answer. Final Fantasy is unusual among most video game franchises in that each numbered entry, referred to as the main series, is a standalone title set in its own world. The franchise is united by recurring ideas and iconography, like terminology for attacks, items, monsters, plot elements, etc. Beyond that, each game has characters, story, art style, and gameplay all its own, which means that each is an entirely different experience. Some games have strong central story arcs, others focus more on developing the characters. Some are turn-based and some are more action-oriented. Some have simple gameplay systems, others are more complex, and the difficulty can skew to easy or hard either way. Which Final Fantasy you'd be interested in depends on what type of games you like to play. The best I could do is help you make an informed decision about which games those may be. And that is what this video is. I'm going to TLDR all of the main series Final Fantasy games. I'll avoid spoilers as best I can, I'll try to cover each game fairly without bias, and I will emphasize when I am expressing my personal opinions. I won't get into spin-offs or sequels, there's just too many to cover. And I also won't get into Final Fantasy XI or XIV. On the one hand, they're MMOs, so I feel recommending them is a different type of question aside from whether they're good or not. And on the other hand, I haven't played them and so I can't judge them properly on my own. Without further delay, let's begin. The NES original takes a lot of cues from early western RPGs, particularly Dungeons and Dragons. The plot is simple. The world is falling apart because the four crystals that govern the forces of nature are losing their power. You play as a band of nameless adventurers that set out to restore the crystals and save the world. There's subplots and story arcs along the way, and a twist at the end, but nothing very complex. Keeping with the D&D inspirations, your party is created at the start of the game from six jobs based on standard adventuring archetypes. The warrior, the rogue, the martial artist, the offensive mage, the supportive mage, and the all-rounder. Battles are turn-based and characters can attack, cast magic, or use items. While there are buffs and debuffs and status ailments to deal with, there's not that much depth to it all. It's a pure numbers game. Enemies hit you, you hit back, kill them before they kill you. Due to the era the game was made and the simplicity of its gameplay, it has a tough difficulty curve, but it isn't overwhelming. Overall, the first Final Fantasy shows its age, but it does have appeal as an old school classic, and is worth playing if only to see how the franchise took root. The story opens on a village being attacked by the Emperor of Palamecia, who is trying to conquer the world. Three youths named Ephirion, Maria, and Guy survive the attack, and they join the Wild Rose Rebellion to fight back against the Empire. The story is as archetypical as it sounds, but it is still enjoyable. There's subplots, plot twists, emotional moments, and a cast of simple but likable characters. The narrative has an episodic format. The party is sent on a mission to aid the Rebellion's efforts against the Empire. They go and complete that mission and report back, possibly with a side plot to resolve along the way so they can continue with their main objective. Final Fantasy II does not have a conventional leveling system. All characters can use any equipment piece and learn any spell, and they improve their stats by using them. For example, someone who attacks with swords a lot will increase their strength and gain skill with swords. This has led to memes that the way to level grind in this game is to have the characters attack themselves, as doing this drags out battles and makes the characters take more hits and get in more attacks, so they get more stat boosts. While this is a valid strategy, you don't need to do it, and it is just a meme. The game is also known for its difficulty. Enemies may outnumber the party, and especially in the late game they have high damage resistances and their normal attacks can inflict debuffs like sleep and paralyze. 
so it's possible for them to chain stun characters for several turns while you deal scratch damage. Final Fantasy II is respectable for its story, but less so for its gameplay. I wouldn't personally recommend it as a first game, as it may give a bad first impression, but for more seasoned fans who want a challenge and know what they're getting into, it's certainly not without value. Final Fantasy III has you play as four kids who stumble upon one of the four elemental crystals, and the crystal bestows power on them to protect the other crystals from dark forces that are trying to destroy them. If that sounds similar to the original game, it is, but three has a stronger storyline and a more fleshed out setting. There's quite a bit of world lore, subplots and side quests to resolve, and a cast of supporting characters that contribute to the story. The game explores why the villain is trying to destroy the crystals, and it's not as simple as him just being evil, and his actions before the game began have had lasting consequences the party has to deal with. Gameplay is similar to the original Final Fantasy, with party members having jobs that define their capabilities, but now characters can change jobs freely and there's more than 20 jobs all with their own distinct skill set. Jobs gain experience and level up separate from the characters and improve as they do, like mages gaining more charges for spells. You're free to experiment with different party setups as you like, adding a lot of strategic depth to the gameplay. The game is difficult, but not as much as the first two, and the greater variety of gameplay options allows more flexibility in tackling challenges. 3 is overall a solid game worth playing, just not as good as the games that have come since. There's two versions of the game, the 2D version and the 3D remake. The remake gives the party members names and personalities, has various tweaks to rebalance the gameplay, and is significantly harder than the 2D version. My advice is to play the 2D version and save the 3D version for a later time. Final Fantasy IV follows Cecil, commander of the airship fleet of the Kingdom of Baron. Though Cecil is loyal to his homeland, he is uncomfortable that the king had him invade an enemy nation to seize their crystal. When he questions these orders, he is stripped of his rank and effectively banished. He learns that the true power in Baron is a warlock named Golbez, who is using their military to gather the crystals for himself. Cecil sets out to gather allies to fight back against Baron and protect the crystals from Golbez. That summary only scratches the surface of things. Final Fantasy IV is widely considered to be the point where the series really started getting good, and a major factor is that it had the best developed story so far. It has a strong cast of characters and a lot of plot twists that change the direction and tone of the story, though some are so well known that it's difficult to talk about the game without dropping casual spoilers. The core theme of the game is a light versus darkness dichotomy, but it also touches on ideas of courage, hatred, revenge, and redemption. Many characters have to confront these ideas as the narrative evolves, causing them to rethink things they thought they understood about themselves and their enemies. 4 is the first game with the active time battle system, which became the standard for many games to follow. Characters and enemies have a time gauge that charges in real time, and when it fills they can take action. This makes battles more active since there is no fixed turn order, anyone could act at any time. You have a party of 5 characters, each with unique abilities. The lineup shifts as characters come and go in accordance with the story, changing the party's synergy as you learn what each character can do. Bosses are rather dynamic. Most of them have some sort of gimmick that changes their attack pattern or what kind of attacks can hurt them, requiring you to adjust your strategy to respond. The difficulty level is overall pretty even. Some areas will pose a challenge, but they're not unfair about it. 4 is not quite as ambitious or complex as later titles, but it is still a great game that has aged very well, which is why it's one of my recommendations to newcomers. This game also has 2D and 3D versions. The 3D version has overhauled gameplay and a much higher difficulty curve that even veteran players can struggle with. On the other hand, it has voice acting and a retranslated script, which gives everything more flair and makes the story come across much stronger. My advice would be to play the 2D version of the game, then give the 3D version a shot if you want to re-experience the story in deeper detail. Final Fantasy V opens with a young adventurer named Bartz, meeting a princess named Lena, an amnesiac old man named Galath, and a pirate named Ferris. The group soon learn that the four crystals are in danger, and are granted power from them to save the world. This premise seems familiar, but this time it is only Act 1 of a larger narrative. The villain's goals are bigger than the crystals, and there is more to the story than protecting them. 
A lot of major plot reveals are given as the villain pursues various plans and the party tries to find out what he's really after and how to stop him, and the unfolding story keeps things interesting. Final Fantasy V is an oddball in the franchise because of its tone. It is much more comedic than most of the other games. That is not to say there are no dramatic or emotional moments, but there isn't much complexity to the characters and the story doesn't take itself too seriously. The game is light-hearted, with lots of jokes, pop culture references, and intentionally cheesy dialogue. While the humor is a bit dated, the localization has changed little from the 2006 version, it does give Final Fantasy V a unique, silly charm. Gameplay is an advanced form of 3's job system. Characters can utilize different jobs with their own abilities, and leveling up jobs teaches characters new abilities that they can equip while using other jobs. You have more control over party customization than ever, and can mix and match traits of different jobs, such as a knight that can use bard songs, or a white mage that can summon. This makes the gameplay rewarding as you try new setups and learn what skills synergize well with each other. Difficulty is above average. The game is not brutally hard, but it will make you work to see the ending. In my opinion, Final Fantasy V is not a standout entry compared to other games in the series, but it's still quite good in its own right. It's usually remembered more for its gameplay rather than its story and humorous tone, but if that appeals to you, you'll probably enjoy it. In this world, magic faded into myth after a great war a thousand years ago, and humanity has rebuilt as an industrialized society. However, the Gestalian Empire has rediscovered the secrets of magic by studying creatures called espers, and are creating magical war machines to conquer the world. A resistance force called the Returners find a young woman named Terra, who was brainwashed by the Empire and lost her memories. Terra has some sort of connection to the Espers and the ability to use natural magic, but she doesn't understand how or why. The Returners decide to shelter her and investigate her abilities to try to find a way to strike back against the Empire. Final Fantasy VI's plot shifts as the party learns about the Empire and the Espers and makes new plans based on what they know. The game is more of a character-focused piece, with a dozen party members plus two bonus characters, and almost all of them have time devoted to fleshing out their personality or giving them a story arc. The latter half of the game is open world, and the overarching narrative takes a back seat to side quests that explore the characters and give closure on their storylines. This is also the game that features Kefka, who ranks among the most memorable and sinister villains of the franchise. The game's theme is the struggle between life and hope and death and despair, and what gives people the strength to endure grief and continue living in spite of their struggles. In battle, each character has their own equipment pool and a unique command ability. A new mechanic is Magicite, items the characters can equip to learn spells and boost their stats when they level up. This is the first game where you can form your own party from the characters you've recruited, which provides a parallel to the job system, in that you can choose characters with skills to fit your needs. Some areas require specific characters for story reasons, but most of the time you can use anyone you want. A shortcoming of gameplay is that it is quite easy once you know what you're doing, but there are still spots that can pose a challenge if you're unprepared. Final Fantasy VI is my personal favorite game of the series, and one of my favorite games of all time. I consider it to have a great story told with a fantastic cast of characters, and it has solid gameplay that is slightly hurt by a below average difficulty curve, which makes it a good jumping on point for newcomers. If you've only heard of one Final Fantasy, it's probably this one. A megacorp called Shinra rules the world thanks to an energy monopoly achieved through their control of Marco. Marco is a fuel source we'll find from the life stream, which is literally the lifeblood of the ecosystem, so Yushin's of Marco is slowly killing the planet. The game follows a mercenary named Cloud, who has been hired by the anti-Shinra group Avalanche to help them sabotage Shinra's facilities. Focus soon shifts to Sephiroth a former Shinra soldier who went missing years ago and had been presumed dead. Cloud has a personal grudge with him and believes he poses a greater threat to the planet than Shinra, so the party sets out to track down Sephiroth. Seven's plot is initially presented as a mystery as the party chases after Sephiroth and pieces together hints about what he's after. There are also mysteries surrounding Cloud, who has gaps in his memory and experiences odd visions and flashbacks. The game has a quasi-episodic structure with most major locations either introducing a party member or developing a party member you've already met. Later parts of the game are more focused on the central narrative of Sephiroth and Shinra, but revisit the earlier character plotlines to follow up on them. 
The story has an overt environmental message, but is more about self-discovery and introspection, and reconciling with your past to look towards the future. Gameplay centers on materia, which allow characters to cast magic, use special attacks, or give them support abilities. Materia will level up and become stronger, and some materia can be connected to each other to augment their effects, like an all materia linked to a magic materia so its spells can affect multiple targets. Since any character can equip any materia, there can be some overlap in their skills, but they have their own stat group and unique equipment to avoid being too similar. This is the first game to make prominent use of a gameplay mechanic called Limit Breaks, also known as simply Limits. Limits are super attacks that charge over multiple battles, and characters learn more limits as you play through the game. The difficulty level is fairly even, leaning towards easy. Some spots are a pain, but you shouldn't struggle too much. While I personally feel Final Fantasy VII has not aged as well as other titles, it is still a great game very much worth playing, and it gets a personal recommendation. I'll also make note of a fan project for the game called Sunamods, an ongoing series of modding projects for the remasters that improve the game further with better models, textures, sound, and even voice acting. If you plan to play the game, look into the modding scene for the PC port. The remake of the game should also be addressed. It only covers part of the original game and expands the story with new characters and subplots, and the world and characters are more fully realized for it. It is also an action RPG rather than turn-based. While I personally like the remake, some of the new plot elements are controversial, and there are things that won't make sense to someone unfamiliar with the original game and its expanded universe. But I've heard a lot of people played the remake without playing the original and enjoyed it on its own merits, so if the remake looks more appealing, it's also a good entry point. Final Fantasy VIII is the story of Squall, a cadet at the military school Balam Garden that trains mercenaries known as Seed. Squall and his classmates are hired to aid in guerrilla operations against the nation of Galbadia, which is allied with a sorceress named Dia. Unlike normal humans, sorceresses can use natural magic and have great power in it, so many people hate and fear them. Adia justifies those views when she takes control of Galbadia and declares war on the Garden, as she has a fierce hatred of Seed and wants to see them destroyed. Squall ends up leading the forces of the Garden against Adia, but there is much more going on in the conflict than he realizes. Final Fantasy VIII's story can be difficult to understand at times, and it has been said the game is more enjoyable on a second playthrough. The story is easier to follow when looking at it in hindsight, as there are subtle bits of foreshadowing and continuity that make the story more cohesive, but they're not obvious if you don't understand what they're hinting towards. The game is told from Squall's perspective with his internal monologue, and he has a prominent romance subplot with a woman named Renoa, which becomes a driving motivation for him later in the game. Friendship is the core theme of the game, expressed most prominently through Squall, who grows from a stoic loner to a bold leader through the influence of his comrades. The story also explores ideas of destiny, duty, and loyalty. The gameplay system is unique. Characters do not learn abilities themselves, they equip guardian forces and the GF learns abilities that benefit their equipped character. Magic is absorbed and stocked in charges, and GFs allow characters to equip stocked magic to their stats to increase them. GFs also have abilities to transform items and spells into other items and spells. While there is a lot of complexity, these mechanics synergize well and are not hard to understand once you take the time to learn how they work. Characters again have limit breaks, but they operate differently from Final Fantasy VII, activating at random when a character is at low HP. The difficulty of the game is erratic because of how the skill system is balanced. Depending on how you make use of the options available to you, you might find it very challenging or very easy. Final Fantasy VIII is a contentious entry for the complexity of its story and gameplay system. In my personal opinion, it is not a bad game, just flawed. It has more than its fair share of fans who love it, and I think it has enough to offer that it is worth playing just maybe not as one of your first experiences in the franchise. In the world of Gaia, Zidane is a member of Tantalus, a band of thieves that masquerades as a theater troupe. Tantalus has been hired to abduct Princess Garnet of Alexandria, but in a twist that surprises even Zidane, Garnet wants to be kidnapped. Though she does not explain why, the answer lies in her mother, Queen Braun. Bron has been acting more vicious lately, and Garnet wishes to flee the castle out of concern for her actions. Soon after she leaves, Bron declares war on Alexandria's neighboring kingdoms. She is aided by a man named Kuja, 
who was actually using Guan's war to further his own schemes. The premise is simple, but there's many plot twists and reveals as events unfold, particularly with what Kuja is up to and the backstories of Zidane and Garnet. The story isn't overly complex, it's fairly easy to explain the full scope of events, but the game takes its time giving you those explanations and is good about foreshadowing them without being too obvious. The art style is more cartoonish than prior games, particularly with character designs, but the subject matter is just as engaging. The game's central theme is the meaning of life, what it means to live, what makes life worth living, and discovering your true self and what your answers to those questions are. Gameplay is more rigid like in earlier titles. Characters each have their own stat growth and skill sets, and you form a party from the characters you've recruited. Abilities are associated with equipment pieces and characters learn them by wearing that equipment to master its ability. Equipment pieces can be combined through a crafting system called synthesis to create new items, and each piece has different stat boosts and elemental affinities that can be used to customize the characters. The limit break system is trance, a gauge that fills as party members take damage, and when it fills they get a temporary power boost. While trance is effective, its activation is involuntary and it can trigger when you don't want to use it making it unreliable. The challenge level is overall above average, but manageable. Final Fantasy IX is a hybrid of the classical fantasy setting of the older games with the complexity and storytelling lessons of later titles, and it's a fantastic game that gets a personal recommendation from me. There's another high-profile fan project to mention, Maguri Mod, that offers additional enhancements to the HD remaster, including expanding its environments for widescreen gameplay. Check it out if you plan to play the game on PC. The game opens on a young man named Titus in the city of Xenarchand, which is attacked by a monster called Sin. Titus is inexplicably transported to the world of Spira, where people live in constant fear of Sin. A source of comfort is the Church of Yevon, a religious order that trains summoners to aid the people by fighting monsters and offering spiritual support. Summoners also go on pilgrimages to receive the Final Summoning, which can temporarily destroy Sin. Sin always revives itself after the Final Summoning, but there are a few years of peace before it does, and the people hope that someday it will be destroyed for good. Titus decides to accompany the summoner Yuna on her pilgrimage, both because he is attracted to her and because the final destination at the end of a summoner's pilgrimage is Xanarkand, but people tell Titus it was destroyed 1000 years ago. Final Fantasy X's story is fueled by emotions, touching on themes of spirituality, sacrifice, atonement, love, and grief. This is placed forefront with a monster called Sin that is fought by followers of a church, but it also shows in personal ways with the party members. The focus of the game is less on major plot reveals, and more how the characters handle those reveals. Of particular mention is Titus' father, Jekt, who went missing when Titus was a child. Jack was emotionally and verbally abusive to Titus, and Titus's complex feelings towards him are an important aspect of his character. Titus finds out Jack also ended up in Spear when he disappeared, and he went on a pilgrimage with Yuna's father. Over the course of his journey, Titus learns more about Jack as a person and what happened to him that he never came home, and their relationship becomes a major crux of the story and its themes. Gameplay is an advanced form of the turn-based combat of older games. A display in the corner of the screen shows the order in which characters and enemies will take their turns. Different commands will cause them to get their next turn sooner or later, so you can strategize around the turn order. The ability system is the sphere grid. Each character starts in their own section of the grid and moves through it to acquire stat bonuses and special abilities. This gives them specific roles, like Lulu using elemental magic against enemies that resist normal attacks, and as the game progresses, the characters can move into other sections of the grid to diversify their skill set. The limit break system is overdrives, where characters charge an overdrive gauge through various methods, and when it fills, they can use a powerful attack. Difficulty is overall moderate, with some areas and bosses being especially challenging. Final Fantasy X has a great balance of a strong story and strong gameplay. It is highly regarded by most fans for good reason, and I recommend it as a solid entry for a newcomer. The game takes place in the land of Ivalice, where the Arcadian Empire has recently conquered the kingdom of Dalmasca. A Dalmascan orphan named Vaughn sneaks into the palace to pilfer some treasure, and meets the sky pirates Balthea and Fran. The three are arrested and forced to work with a disgraced Dalmascan officer named Bosch to escape, and must rescue Vaughn's friend Penelo from one of Balthea's rivals. 
The five meet a woman named Ash, the former princess of Dalmasca. Ash has been in hiding trying to organize a rebellion against the Empire, but the rebellion has been broken and now she must accept help where she can get it, even from traitors and outlaws. Thus the six become unlikely allies to fight Arcadia for their own reasons. Final Fantasy XII is a different sort of story than other main series Final Fantasy titles. It has been compared to Game of Thrones, in that it is the story of nobles and warlords plotting against each other. There is a larger plot beyond the party's adventures, and their actions have rippling effects as characters react to them. The villains of the game are complex individuals with layers to their actions, and your characters aren't paragons of virtue themselves, giving a lot of moral ambiguity to things. The game uses a more subtle type of storytelling than most Final Fantasy games, which is sometimes a weakness. Major plot developments happen off-screen without the party being directly involved, so some of the nuances of the plot may go unnoticed. The game explores questions of honor, pride, patriotism, and revenge, and the interplay of different types of power, like how an influential name, used properly, can be just as dangerous as an army. Gameplay is a hybrid of turn-based and real-time. Characters and enemies move and fight in the field, with each action they take having a charge time to execute. You can input commands manually, but the game eases micromanagement with a system to let you program each character's AI like which types of enemies to target first, or prioritizing healing allies instead of attacking. The skill system is the license board, a grid with tiles for special abilities, stat bonuses, and equipment. In order to use an item or ability, a character must acquire the license for it. Limit breaks are called quickenings, quick time attacks you can chain together by inputting the next attack within a time limit. Difficulty is overall even, but with the opportunity for more challenges if you want one. 12 is also notable for the sheer quantity of optional content it has, possibly the most of any main series title. Most dungeons have extra areas to unlock later in the game, there are hundreds of bonus bosses and rare enemies, and a lot of powerful items to acquire by farming from enemies. This content is not limited to the end game either, it becomes available as you progress in the story and the world opens up to you, providing plenty of diversions if you don't feel like continuing the main quest. Final Fantasy XII is overall an excellent game. While I personally love it, it may not give an accurate first impression of Final Fantasy as a franchise, so I hesitate to recommend it for a newcomer. But if you like what you've heard and want a game you can sink hundreds of hours into, then XII may be the title for you. The game opens on the floating city of Cocoon, which hovers over the surface world of Pulse. The two civilizations have a hostile history, and are ruled by godlike beings called Falsi. Falsi can anoint humans as servants, the Sea, giving them the power to use magic. The Sea are assigned a specific task to complete for their Falsi master. If they fail, they become zombies, but successes were rewarded by turning them into crystal until the Falsi awakens them for another assignment. By happenstance, five cocoon citizens are turned into the Sea by a Falsi from Pulse and they believe it has ordered them to destroy Cocoon. The group goes on the run as fugitives and try to figure out what to do with themselves. Thirteen's story is a personal journey for its cast. The story explores how people deal with tragedy and destiny, particularly since the characters know they are going to die one way or the other, and there seems to be nothing they can do to change that. The overarching narrative doesn't really become clear until the second half of the game, when it is revealed there was a hand guiding events behind the scenes. A common criticism of the game is that its story is reliant on text logs and flashbacks to explain things. This is partially true. Many important events happened in the weeks before the game began and are shown in flashbacks given out of order, and a lot of lore on the characters and setting are left to text logs. Speaking from personal experience, when I first played 13, I made a point to not read the text logs to see if I could follow the story without them. And I could but I do feel that something should have been explained more clearly and in a more timely manner. Combat is a variant of the ATB system. Each character has a segmented gauge that fills over time, and different commands require different amounts of gauge to use. Characters can be assigned one of six roles, fighter, mage, tank, healer, buffer, and debuffer. You set up party formations, called paradigms, and switch between them during battle to change attack patterns. As characters grow, they can eventually use all six roles, but they don't have equal proficiency in them. A new mechanic is the Stagger Gauge. When it fills, enemies are stunned and take extra damage, and their strategies and different types of enemies being more difficult to stagger, 
having different conditions to stagger them, and different paradigm roles being better at filling the gauge. Strategy is more about you planning your paradigms and using them effectively than giving characters specific commands in battle, which can make combat feel more hands-off than other games. Thirteen is a contentious entry, but it definitely has its defenders who enjoy it. I personally recognize its flaws, but I didn't dislike it, and I don't think it's a bad game. But even when considering its strengths, it isn't the best the series has to offer. On the planet of Eos, the Kingdom of Lucis has long been at war with the Empire of Niflheim. Recently, Niflheim has proposed a peace treaty, a condition of which is that the Lucian Prince Noctis be married to Lady Luna Freya, a childhood friend of his from a nation occupied by Niflheim. While Noctis and his friends are traveling to meet her, Lucis's capital of Insomnia is seized by Niflheim. The peace talks were just a ruse for an invasion. With their home fallen and Niflheim hunting for them, the group searches for a means to gain power to strike back against them. In addition, they learn more about a prophecy that Noctis will someday become the true king that will save the world from a plague of darkness. It is difficult to discuss Final Fantasy XV without discussing its development. It began as a spin-off of Final Fantasy XIII, called Final Fantasy vs. XIII, but the project stagnated due to a small staff and technical difficulties. The decision was made to rebrand the game under a new director, and vs. XIII was reworked into a standalone title, Final Fantasy XV. This troubled development reflects in the final product. Many aspects of the setting aren't fully fleshed out, the story lacks focus, and an animated prequel and a CGI movie provide important plot points not given in-game. In my personal opinion, the story itself is not bad, but it isn't told very well and requires supplementary material to fully understand it. A saving grace is the characters. Noctis and his friends have a great group dynamic. They have hobbies integrated into gameplay, they banter and chat among themselves, and you really buy that these four are lifetime friends. Standing against them is Arden, who provides a very interesting and entertaining main antagonist. Most of his backstory is given in side materials and his DLC add-on, but he's a very good villain once you know his full story. Brotherhood is the game's central theme, exploring the bonds of Noctis and his friends and what their friendship means to each of them. It also discusses themes of duty, fate, legacy, and sacrifice. The game is an action RPG. Noctis can equip various weapons with different types of attacks, and can quickly switch weapons in battle to change its fighting style. As he fights, a tech gauge fills that can be used to order allies to use special attacks. Other special attacks can be triggered by coordinating attacks with allies, like hitting enemies from behind or parrying an attack. New abilities are learned through skill trees that augment different aspects of gameplay, like adding effects to Noctis' attacks or unlocking new tech gauge attacks for his allies. The limit break system is the Amaga, where Noctis wields the ancestral weapons of the Kings of Lucis. Amaga grants Noctis increased power and unique attacks, but only lasts a short time. With the Royal Edition add-on, your three allies can be directly controlled in battle and have their own gameplay mechanics. Difficulty is not very high, but due to how frantic battles can get and how they can overwhelm you as a player, combat can degrade into just attacking enemies wildly and spamming healing items to stay in the fight. Final Fantasy XV is deeply flawed with an uneven story, but it has a lot of heart. Its creators were clearly trying to create an ambitious game with a large scope and deep story, but the final product fell short of the mark. Thanks for watching all the way through. I hope I've been able to help some of you make a choice on which Final Fantasy games you may want to play. Comment below if you have any questions or if you feel I've left anything out. I'd be happy to answer you, and I'm sure others will too.